Meetings. It's really great to be here, a very special occasion really, to have all the candidates who are looking for one of the two seats on the MLC part of, uh, of Timwald. And of course they will have a position for around 15 months. And it's, it's obviously exciting, we've had this chance to hear from them and also you have a chance in the audience to ask your questions. Of course we don't have a vote, but I think it, it does bring to mind exactly what people can make a perception of people standing for this. So thank you for everyone for coming out on this uh, Monday. And um, what I'm going to do is going to ask everyone to do a maximum of two minutes to start with. This is just a, a sort of introduction from them on, on the then say about themselves. And then I'll ask a few what I call obvious questions, maybe, just to get the thing going. And then after that, over to you. Damien has the microphone, so please just raise your hand. He'll come to you. And uh, we've only got one microphone here, so we'll be passing up and down the table. So uh, I thank everyone will introduce yourselves. So we'll start at the top of the table. If your microphone is on. I'm going to talk. Oh, Over to you. Can you hear me up at the back? It's, it's always the, yeah, the vocal ones that sit at the back. Don't they? <laughs> good evening, everybody. Um, it's good to meet, see so many of you brave the dark night to meet us all. I'm Corelli Bentham, and I'd like to explain why I've put myself forward to the member of Legislative Council and why I think I am appropriate. Um, I don't know whether you've had the opportunity to read our CVs, but I'll briefly explain my professional background. I'm a trained quantity surveyor, which means I deal with the financial and contractual aspects of construction projects. I've worked on both sides of the fence for contractors and clients, for the private sector, public sector, working in the Isle of Man, UK, Hong Kong and China. I moved into the education sector 12 years ago lecturing in construction at the college, and I became head of construction, which I did with passion and energy for five years. We concentrated on recruitment and the quality of our provision, and year on year, our student numbers grew and the quality of our courses improved. My job choices have always been to make a difference, and I have always been involved in quality assurance, training and upskilling. This is where my passion lies. Although my career is construction orientated, it doesn't make me a one-trick pony. The construction industry is very much aligned to other industries, hospitality, catering, agriculture, horticulture and engineering. So, when considering whether I was up to the task, I looked at the CVs of the current MLC members. In any recruitment process, in filling vacancies, you look at the skills and experience of the existing team and then fill the gaps in the organisation. There is a broad range of experience on the council at present, but I feel my particular emphasis on education, construction and the environment from the boots on the street perspective could assist the current council. Two minutes. I learned. Thank you very much. That's <laughs> <laughs> time it works. <laughs> okay. Oh, have a stop with that. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you all, and thanks, Ag, and everybody for giving us this opportunity tonight. Uh, I'm Craig Brown. Uh, I'm a former company director. I've been on the island now for just over 13 years. Moved here 13 years ago with my wife, Natasha, who's a, a former head teacher. And I'm somebody that has very much made the island my home. Uh, it's been somewhere that I've felt comfortable from day one, incredibly welcomed. And that is very much why I want to become an NLC and to start contributing more to the future of this island. To tell you a little bit about myself, um, I'm an engineer by background, albeit that I'm, uh, I've recently been in the finance sector. Uh, from a, a council state upbringing, I attended grammar school, did engineering at university, moved then into the accounting profession, and uh, qualified as a chartered accountant and chartered tax advisor. And from there, I moved into industry for around 20 years uh, in various roles, forming an uh, international strategy for businesses, and giving me very good experience at reading complex legislation, interpreting and implementing that. And that's a skill that I brought with me to the island, and something that I've implemented within the businesses over here. However, as a businessman, it's not about the money. That is the end result. For me, it's always been about the people, 
making a difference in the stewardship. And I'm at a point in my life now where retirement is closer than it was further away. I want to do things that contribute to having a sustainable, good uh, location for me and my wife to have our retirement and for everybody else to have the same as well. So I really would like the opportunity to apply those skills that I've learned in over 30 years in business uh, to help Tim Wald and uh, I very much hope that I have the opportunity to do that. Just on the money there, thank you very much indeed. So, on with uh, Mary Beth. Hello everyone, I'm Mary Beth Cole and I'm thrilled to be here presenting in front of, with a, alongside a bunch of formidable candidates. For those of you who haven't had the pleasure to meet, I'm one of the vintners of Foraging Vintners, the Iron Man's Winery down in Port Aaron. I'm also a board member of the Visit Agency and active in our local trade association called Visit Port Aaron. Oh, I also have a full-time day job where I work in a legal and contracts team with yacht management on the island with involved in jurisdictions over 15 of them worldwide. As you can probably hear, I'm not native to the Isle of Man, but I got here as soon as I could. My story coming to the island is not entirely unusual. We came with the intention to be here for a year or two, but fell in love with the island and, been, and have not looked back for over 10 years. The island has been incredibly accommodating to us, and we received the full Celtic embrace. I was born and raised up and down the eastern seaboard of the, U the U.S. between Florida and New Jersey. I went to high school in Freehold, New Jersey, the same as Bruce Springsteen, and uh, went to university and studied political science at the University of Houston in Texas. I've always had an interest in how our government institutions impact decision-making and form my interest to study law as a postgraduate at the University of Queensland. We, we move back to, uh, I'm, a role, I'm on the role of solicitors in Australia. I'm also barred in Colorado and New York. My legal work was heavily involved in property, natural resources, and environmental law. And believe it or not, those areas are very heavily regulated, both federally and state. So engaging with the government is just something I do. When we relocated to the Isle of Man, we opened a startup business, which caused us to get involved with the government right away. I feel like the culmination of my experience and background makes me a good candidate to become a member of Legislative Council. Thank you very much indeed. Pass it over, and Paul is next. Thank you, and fast tonight, good evening. I'm Paul Crane, I was born in the Isle of Man. I've been married to Anne for more than 40 years, and we have two grown-up daughters and two granddaughters. I'm passionate about most things, Max. I was educated at Murray's Road and Balakameen and St. Indians. I studied at Liverpool University for six consecutive years, reading for a geography degree, then a research degree into the population of the Isle of Man, and then teacher training. More than 40 years after I started researching the population, I'm still engaged in research of the population. I published the Isle of Man Population Atlas in 2016, which demonstrated analytical skills and attention to detail, personal drive, start to finish here, and so on. My career in education began as a teacher on Merseyside and spanned six decades, which if you try to work that out, that's from 79, 1979 to 2021. At Castle Russian, I was head of geography and assistant head teacher. I then worked as the senior advisor for secondary education in the Isle of Man and became an accredited offset inspector at schools. I hope to say more about inspection and scrutiny later. Uh, scrutiny in an educational context is never about opposition, it is about challenge and improvement, and it focuses primarily on delivery and outcomes. My career in education has been remarkably broad and varied over a period when change has been almost continuous. In 2014, I led the 14-16 qualification reforms in the Isle of Man that introduced the IGCSEs and some of the Scottish awards. Some people consider public service and, and say that they wish to put something back. I feel I've always tried to do that. As a charity worker, a teacher, as Island Games team manager three times, as an elected member of a local authority for nine years, as a scout leader, climate reality leader and other roles. I'm passionate and enthusiastic about everything I do. I'm a team player. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> Is that too much? <laughs> Come on, okay. Connor. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for giving us all the opportunity uh, to speak with the Positive Action Group um, and to answer your, all your questions. Uh, to briefly introduce you, uh, to briefly introduce myself to you guys, sorry. Um, I'm a serving teacher at Bramley Grammar School. Um, I was educated on the island at Bram, uh, Bramley School and QE2 Secondary School uh, before leaving to study at 
to Liverpool and Lancaster. Um, the island was, uh, and I believe, remains an excellent place to live, and it was always my intention to come back here. Um, and I'm really glad that I've been able to do that and, and hopefully give back to the community um, in my career, which I'm currently doing, and I hope to continue to do so. Um, I now live in Kirk Michael uh, with my young family. I'm uh, primarily a P teacher, but I also teach geography. Um, so, uh, as you can understand, my main hobbies would be what, sort of watching, playing sport and engaging in, in that in the local community. Um, and also exploring the, the wonderful outdoors that we have on the island. My main uh, motivation is to seek a nomination to, to let go, but I believe I offer a different perspective in terms of the scrutiny role, uh, scrutinising legislation from a, a different perspective. Um, I, I don't feel like I fit the profile of a, of a traditional um, LegCo member, if you like. Um, so I would be considering legislation with more of a focus on how it would affect policy, um, kind of on the, on the front line, if you like. Um, we've just elected, uh, as, a, as a nation, our, our most diverse House of Keys. Um, within that, uh, the most diverse uh, council of ministers have been formed, uh, and I believe that I represent a, a diverse option to, to legislative council as well, and uh, to complete that, that kind of diversity element within Timor. Thank you. Thank you, Rajit. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Diane Kelsey. Um, I currently work as the Lieutenant Governor's Private Secretary. Um, and um, my background is that I grew up in, on the Isle of Man uh, in the 70s. My father's Manx, um, I went to uh, St John's Prime School and uh, Castle Austin, and then the Brown School at um, Peel um, in 1979. Father's job took us away and then did university, and I was then did 23 years in the Royal Air Force. Um, so, um, and my Air Force um, career was also. Uh, linked to the Isle of Man. The reason why I joined the Air Force and in fact married my husband Colin is because I was still friends with a, a girl I sat with, uh, I sat with on the first day at primary school in St John's and she was in the Air Force. I got to know her again and then I found out what the Air Force was about. So the, the Isle of Man had stuck through my uh, early career as well. The Isle of Man itself has been a constant in my life. For 55 years, I have been coming backwards and forwards or living on the Isle of Man. Um, and I'm very, very passionate about this place. Um, I feel now the experience I've got over the last four and a half years of seeing the legislation, not necessarily doing it, I, 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 I'm very careful, that's not what my current role is, but seeing it and seeing how the emergency regulations were dealt with during the COVID emergency, but then wider than that, over the time I've seen the work that LegCo and in fact the Keys have been doing to make sure we get good Manx law, or at the very least, the best Manx law that we can get at the time. I now feel that I've got the experience to look at that and scrutinise that uh, and review it and help to make good Manx law in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. And I'm Bill. Thank you. I'm Bill Simmons. I served as image key for middle from 2016 to 2021. And prior to that, I was in banking for 34 years and I ran a number of the banks here in Ireland, which gave me a good understanding of the Manx economy. I can bring my skills, my previous experience to the MLC role, and if elected, I will make a significant contribution over the next 15 months. I offer integrity, professionalism, and attention to detail. I can hit the ground running, which is important. As many decisions are being made now, and then the next two months, which will affect the course of the next administration. I'm fully committed to this role, and if elected, I will fully discharge all NLC responsibilities. However, I'm unable to commit to a five-year term, so if circumstances remain for me as they are, I will not be standing for re-election in March 2023. I firmly believe that my diligence and my drive will support the new administration at a critical time uh, to meet the challenges that we face. If I'm elected, I will provide scrutiny alongside injecting rigour and pace. To be effective, our parliament needs to drive positive outcomes for people. Reports, strategies and policies are all well and good, but it's the delivery of outcomes which really matters. And I bring a strategic mindset to complex issues and look for pragmatic, workable solutions to deliver those outcomes. So I hope that I will be able to bring this to bear and serve on the Legislative Council for the next 15 months to help drive positive change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. 
questions. I don't mind going on with that. I'm just going to kick off with some of what I call the, the very obvious questions. So I will move right down one each time. We'll start with you. I'll have time on it, but don't feel panicked. We'll start at the very end. We'll start at the top. Uh, the question is, uh, is this a full-time job? And whatever your answer is, I want you to qualify that. You know, it might be a yes or it might be a no answer. And you have time to think about that. And we'll go down the whole table. And when it comes to questions, if, if I ask you to have the questions for the whole panel rather than an individual person, I think that would be important as well. So, when, is this a full-time, do you see it's a full-time job? And whatever your answer is, can you qualify your answer, please? I do think it's a full-time job. Um, it says in the job spec it's a full-time job. Um, in fact, I think it's more than that. I think you, you live and breathe it. I know other MLCs have done. Um, I, I, because I am open and transparent, I have got my own company. Um, I'll do it in my sleep. I've got a great partner who will step up and take that on. That so, will you step down for that or not step down? No, I won't step down. So, it won't be full-time? It, I will do a full-time job as my NRC yeah. role if I'm elected, yeah. but I am a complete workaholic <laughs> and I can take on anything, so yeah. Right. yeah that's my answer. Thank you much. I don't think there'll be many surprises. I suspect it's going to be seven yeses that you're receiving, Paul. Absolutely, it's a full-time job. Um, it's a huge commitment to the island um, in order to uh, exercise the appropriate diligence to do the job justice. I don't see how you could do that in anything less than a full-time job. Um, in my working career, I've never had a nine-to-five job. Um, it's doing what needs to be done and spending the time available. So for this, I would see it very much in the same vein. There will be work that needs to be done and I will dedicate to that the, the time that's needed. Um, full disclosure, I'm under pain of death from my wife that I support her with Swinging the Isle, which is a, a dancing um, group on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Uh, I'm told that as her glamorous assistant, I have to continue to do that, um, which is an unpaid job, uh, and I will be continuing to support her with that. But other than that, the MLC role will be my sole occupation. Like. Carelli and Craig, um, I too view the MLC role as a full-time job. I have a full-time job now, which I would swap out, um, but I'd still remain active in foraging vendors. But we're lucky we're at a stage of how the business is running where we have uh, people who are managing the operations, and I'm mainly involved in helping doing strategic decisions about product development and whatnot. And my husband, I'm fortunate enough, is pretty got a pretty solid solid grip on the reins of how we're going, so I definitely view this as a full-time job. I feel the last set of um, MLC candidates that came through and up through the ranks have raised the standard, they've raised the bar, and we need to keep it there, and we need to keep that energy and that enthusiasm for the, the role that it can do to support the NHKs and the House and Keys. We need to keep it at that level. Okay. Thank you. If I can, um, yes, I, I see it as a full-time job. I'm expecting that if I was um, able to take on this role, that yeah, it, it would be full-time plus. I, it's the sort of role that um, an enormous amount of paperwork, things to read and so on. But beyond that, it's a bottomless pit in terms of what you can research, investigate, and explore, and the issues you can raise, and the uh, scrutiny you can begin to uh, gain ideas on and so on. And I've got the full support of, of my wife, and uh, uh, and family away, and um, yeah, we expect it to be a, a, a full time source role. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, much like everybody else, I would certainly see it as a full time role. Um, as I'm sure we all have, as, as part of my due diligence process for this job, I've uh, engaged with MHK and, and current MLCs as well. Um, from chat to those, uh, they, there's nothing short of, uh, of this being a full time job in terms of the various aspects that come with it, in terms of the scrutiny aspect. In terms of those active roles you need to play within Tim World. Um, for, for me, it would, it would represent a full time job, it would represent a career change as well. Um, I think it was Bill highlight before, it is only for a short term. Um, but if, if elected, I'm confident that within that short term, I'd be able to demonstrate my uh, value to Tim World. Um, so, in terms of me, from, from personally, it would be a career change. Um, as a servant teacher, obviously, it would be a notice period that I'd have to serve um, and, and almost a, a kind of managed exit, if you like, from school, because I've got commitment to take the exam classes and GCSE classes at the moment. Um, so that would just need to be managed. But once that's out of the way, it certainly would represent a full-time job for me also. Thank you, Diane. 
I have to say, I don't know if it's a full-time job yet, but I do know I have to give up my full-time job to be able to do it. So why do I say it that way? I think, like with all jobs, you can make them fill 24 hours of your day or do two, three hours a day and think you've got away with it. My plan would be to do what I do in all my jobs and all the different things I've done in my life, and that I'll give my all to it, and therefore I will be expecting to work full-time and more. And, and I'll know more once uh, there's, there's elections, you know what's happening next. But no, I would treat it as a full-time job. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Yes, it's a full-time job. I've got no other commitments and I absolutely fully engage in all aspects of the role and to mold and I can start immediately and I'll add value from day one. So I think the taxpayer would get good value for money. Squirt the thing that comes back. <laughs> okay. Um, do you, would you go on, on board, yeah, would you go on departments and get qualified that? I mean, it may not be coming up, it may not happen, but so would you see yourself being able to take a role in government if asked? I think as you say, that could be a good point, in that my understanding is that many, if not all of the department positions have been filled. Mm -hmm. um, it's a, a heavily debated topic at the moment, and something that I'm very mindful uh, was one of the recommendations in the Liz Bain report. Um, so I think it's actually very difficult on the outside looking in to say whether or not MLCs should have department roles. My personal view is that if asked by a minister um, to add to a department, I would be happy to consider that and to participate in an appropriate manner. And I think it would be in very much a non-executive capacity, so not necessarily involved in the, the running and voting of the department, but sharing expertise and being able to exercise some of that oversight and control from within, because it's much easier to do that from within than from without. So it, it is a qualified answer, Paul, but um, with the appropriate qualifications and with the appropriate restrictions, yes, I would, but it would have to be non-executive. Thank you. Similar to Craig, I, I share the same similar view. Um, interestingly enough, I spoke with one of the NHKs where he explained uh, where the role of uh, MLC in a department was very useful, and I found it very interesting. Where they were sort of serving, they were creating more rounded answers. You had the the MHK who has to answer to their constituency, and you have the civil servants who have to answer to a whole other different set of uh, parameters, where the person who was the MLC who was in the department was able to kind of facilitate more agreements, more compromise between both competing interests. And I felt that that was quite an interesting way to look at the role of a, of a MLC within a department. But I think initially, for a year and three months, it would be pretty hard to make any kind of significant impact initially as an MLC in, within that short amount of time. However, if there's a certain task or project that has about that time, sort of time schedule, then yeah, it would definitely be something that I'd be open to. Okay. Thank you very much. And having met with most of the, the members of the Keys, and I'm very aware of the different views that exist uh, between them. In the job description for the MLC role, it specifically says that they may be called on to take roles in government, which presumably would mean um, predominantly within departments. But um, many members have, have said they, they don't think it's a good idea to be in the, in the department. Others have said this is a very small parliament. We need, we need people to do the work, to share in, in the work. Some MLCs have successfully been involved in departments. Some have identified that they want to be non-voting members. Some are only prepared to take on the role if they think it can add value. So I'm open to advice on that. It may be that the 15-month time limit actually determines what's possible and what isn't. But the one thing I would say is that I would not want a role in the department to reduce the capacity to provide scrutiny, which is a key part of the job description coming through. And uh, that, that would be perhaps a prime determinant what, uh, what opportunities for scrutiny might be lost if you're spending a couple of days a week in the department. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, for me, it's about getting the best skills across the whole of Timwood. Um, I don't feel particularly strongly that the MLC should be in departments, but equally, I, I don't feel they should be um, discouraged from being members either. Um, I think it's crucially about getting the best outcomes for Timwood, which in turn gets the best for the, for the people of the island. Um, from a personal perspective, if asked by a minister or department 
Uh, I would consider whether I, I thought I could add value, and if I could, I would be willing to. Uh, but equally, I don't think it should be the position of MLT to push themselves onto, onto a department. Um, from, a, from a scrutiny point of view, as I say, we're, I think everybody's quite au fait at our certainly on the panel with, with the role of uh, the scrutiny element to, to the position. Uh, for me, if you are on a department and can add value before the scrutiny process or early on in the scrutiny process, which stops legislation going down and time being wasted later on, I think that's a, that's a positive thing. So if that means that, a, that a, an MLC can offer that early on in the process as a member of the department, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing if it saves time in the long run. But from a personal perspective, if asked, I would consider it. And if I felt I could add value, um, I, I would certainly consider it. Thank you. Um, I think, from my perspective, I have a, a, a range of skill sets that might be of use. That doesn't mean to say that I should end up on a, 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 a voting member in a department or on a committee. However, if there was a project that was coming up that actually my skill set could be used for, then certainly, if asked, I would consider it, and similar to um, what several of the colleagues have said, if I can add some value, then I would do that. But I do still believe that the main role is to provide that time, that energy, that diligence to the scrutiny, which is maybe um, one of the areas where the MHKs are busy doing a lot of other things as well as the, the work they do with legislation. And I think it's very useful to have a, a group of people who perhaps aren't um, quite so stuck um, in doing stuff for their either constituents or for departments. So I think that clear. You would go on as part of it? Probably not, but if, I was, but, but if there was a project that I could support and I had the right skill set. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Bill. Thank you. No, my, my personal view is that MHKs should lead on policy, so I wouldn't sit in the department. However, if there was technical bills, I would be happy to help a uh, department. So I took through a large number of bills for Treasury in the last five years, some place were quite complex. I think my previous experience helped. So you wouldn't sit in the park, you would be there taking a bill when policy has been agreed. Um, I also recognise so we're in a small place and we all need to put our shoulder to the wheel. Um, so I'm delighted to serve in some of the new boards that are being set up, which I'm very excited about. The housing board, I think there is a housing crisis in this island. I've got previous experience, extensive experience in mortgages and other aspects. I think it can add real value to that board to get some tangible help out there for people. Climate change board, again, something I'm passionate about. Turn that kind of these lofty ideals into practical things for people. I'm delighted to help with that. Or the economic board. Um, again, I served on the economic recovery group in, in Treasury for five years. Got a really good understanding of, about the Max economy. So I think in fact add value across one or two or three of those boards in addition to the scrutiny, which I am absolutely clear is, is the key focus of, of this role. Thank you. Curiosity, on to go. Hurry up. We're all here. And finally. Um. It's hard being the last person, isn't it? Um, it's better than the first person. It is, yeah. Um, I think I agree with Paul, really, that I think the primary role is to be the scrutineer, and that's where I would want to invest my time. Um, however, um, the boards um, that Bill mentioned, housing, I think we've got a bit of synergy there, Paul, climate change, that's where I think I could contribute. So if I could contribute, and I was asked to, then I would do so willingly. Okay, well, Damien, turn your microphone on. Uh, just to give an idea, if you can put your hands in the air now, if you've you already got a question in mind, so we you know how much time we've got tonight. If you've already got a question, can you just let us know now? Put your hand in the air. So we've got one, two, so not too many, but maybe hopefully more will arrive. And again, you can make sure you, it's a question for the whole panel, and it is a question, not a statement, so that would be helpful. And you're going to start. Yeah. So, here you go. Over to Damien to you. Let's get the first question, please. Okay. This is Stephen Moore. Good evening, everybody. My question is... I can't do a direct... Oh, we're blowing up. Can you hear me? Yes. Hold it a bit further away, maybe. Can you hear me now? That's fine. You're fine. I'll just have to give a little brief... Uh, a question, please, though, not a statement. Well, there will be a long statement. You're going to make a statement, right? Well, there will be a little bit of a statement. <laughs> In the, in the UK, and I know we 
we don't compare ourselves with the Westminster Parliament, but there is occasions when the House of Lords sends legislation back to the Commons for huh? for uh, for real look at it. Is is the is, is the vigilance show the Praetorian Guard for Coleman, or would any of the candidates be prepared to say no to some legislation, legislation if it wasn't right and uh, send it back? Okay, so when you say no to some legislation and send it back is where we were getting to, the microphone was picking at some of that up. So, so, I'm just making sure I understand the question. So, within the Westminster system, you're saying that uh, there's sometimes an opportunity for the House of Lords to revert a bill back to Commons for them to relook at it and redraft it or have more discussion about it. You then scrutinise them to make amendments, basically. So, yes. yeah, so I think I think that's part of the role here. That's a great question, to be fair. Um, I, does, it, does that happen here often? Not often. Yeah, not <laughs> right, so... I, 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 think, you know, I think a lot of the difference is, is that we are so small here that there's people we can, we can have these conversations and maybe some, if it's something quite uh, politically offensive to a lot of people where there is a lot of outrage about it, where people feel like it, it needs to have more debate about it and it has to have more robust discussion, then yes, probably that would be something that you could consider to send back to the House of Keys from Ledgeco. However, I, I would imagine that most of the time, that most of the people within the House of Keys have, are, have the ability to have access to one another, and we have the ability to contact one another and have more and more dialogue. So that might not necessarily be a, a reason that that happens here. Okay. Are you going to be inside the tent or are you going to be arsy? Would that be roughly it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just kind of crazy. <laughs> Thank you. I think in Washington, it's really important that. Um, the different branches of Tibble work together and work constructively and whilst it's important that um, scrutiny of legislation is constructive in, in its movement forward. Um, we did get the, the interesting comments from the Chief Minister last week about um, the need for a, a degree of friction and the degree need for no cozying up. You know, I, I think it, and I'm prepared to, I'm prepared to speak out, but I'm not outspoken, if that makes sense, okay? I'm very happy with that position. I'm very happy to say, as I find it, as someone with experience of Ofsted inspections, um, I know what really thorough examination is, and I know what it is to be giving a report back that's going to be, um, going to cause a degree of friction. You know, I've been in that position, and you have to go through with it, but you need your evidence needs to be firm. I think if the legislation you were looking at really wasn't adequate, then you might be forced into that position of sending it back, as you said. But I think it's much more likely that you'd simply be going through with very thorough scrutiny, pointing out all the issues and explaining why, as, as the overview of that, is that it has an awful lot of deficiencies. And I think that's much more likely. Thank you. Um, as I said, I think it was mentioned from before there, I think that process does happen, but perhaps it's not necessarily, not necessarily so um, overt from the, from the public perspective. I think in the, the kind of workings of legislative buildings, those discussions are already happening. Um, the, the short answer is, is yes. Um, for me, it's about the, the quality of the legislation. It needs to be good quality legislation. Um, the, the challenge is good. Um, if the, the challenge needs to be there to, to, to back up why, the, why the, the, uh, the bill or the legislation is, is designed to be going through. Um, so that challenge needs to be there. That can be from a good point of view or from a positive point of view and from a, a sort of negative point of view. If there's an area that can be developed in that, at the end of the day, it's to get good quality legislation. And if there's improvements that need to be made, I would say I'm comfortable to send it back, yes. Quite similar to uh, what Connor's just said, in that I'd be very comfortable to send something back or at least to raise an objection or comment or debate. But you've got to remember there's 10 other people uh, on the legislative council, and actually what you've got to be able to do is work with them as well. And it might well be that you've missed the point of something, or actually you misread something. 
So I think the um, the simple answer is, of course, if um, let's code decides to send something back, then they should be able to do so. Um, would I want to voice a, voice an opinion that I thought something was not well written or not well understood? Then yes, of course I would. But I then work with colleagues, uh, certainly uh, let's code colleagues, to make sure that if we were to send something back, it'd be for good reason and not just to waste people's time. Bill. Yeah, thanks so much. This actually happened a lot in the last few years, and it tended to be portrayed by the media as let's go versus keys. The reality was quite different. It was let's go and backbenchers versus Coleman. And let's not forget, Coleman is a block hole in keys. So, unfortunately, there was a number of um, poorly thought out pieces of legislation, what I describe as dumb stuff, that had clearly been put in quickly. Some of it was uh, due to COVID, um, so you know, there were mitigating circumstances, but in the last administration, legislative council played a really important role, and they were not afraid to do that. Two of the, the most capable members of that, 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 that cohort of, of LegCo, uh, Jane and Kate, have moved up to Keynes, so there, there are some big shoes to fill, this is the point I would make. I would be very comfortable voting against a law and sending it back to think again. I see that as a key aspect of the role, but it, it needs to be done, as people have said, in a collegiate way. But right it's an important check. Okay, okay. Pass it back. Pass it, pass it. Well, LegCo meet weekly and debate legislation, that's their role. Um, and they, 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 they vote on it. So they have acted as a backstop and stopped and sent legislation back. And I, in not a, a negative sense, but I think it's more, it gave the backbenchers and Comey time to pause, reflect, think about it, and things have changed throughout that process. So that, that, that's the, the way it works, as I believe. Finally, great. Not really very much to add. I honestly believe that any member or any MLC would do precisely that. It's part of the job. Uh, and you have a, a conscience to behave appropriately. So, as everybody has said, it should be collegiate, there should be debate, there should be discussion. But ultimately, if you believe something is wrong, you have to have the courage of your convictions and send that back until it's correct. So, yes, I, I would vote against it. Thank you, Mr. Steve Wright. Um... Next question, David. You want to put the microphone, someone with a hand up? Okay. Hi, Steve. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, Andrew Jessen. Going back to this issue of uh, legislation, it's, it's something I've been coming, paying for for a long time, and hopefully, um, whoever the two winning candidates are, maybe you would, uh, uh, from the inside, join this campaign and, and, and work towards getting legislation that's written in plain English. So would you support a change to the way that we do legislation that is written in a way to make lawyers rich? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Got in there. Right. Plain English. Okay. Um, or Manx. For the, for the or Manx, Manx. yes. Yeah. So for the last 30 years I've been a revisor on GCSE specifications. Okay, so that means that, um, for example, last week I was working on the 2023 paper for one of the main English exam boards, and the paper arrives to me with its resources and, and the questions already written. My role, um, over a period of, of, of a day or so, is to provide scrutiny for this, going through the um, figures one by one, going through the questions, word by word, sentence by sentence, comma by comma, and giving feedback. And the feedback is not just about is this question in the specification, it's is this question clear, is it unambiguous, will the average 60 year old understand it, um, and is it of an appropriate level of demand for GCSE questions. Okay, so I'm very, very used to working through questions and trying to simplify them, break them down so people understand. I'm very happy to do that, very happy to support legislation in plain English, although I'm fully aware that those who, who take the legal position, may want to have some specific phrases in there which are long-standing phrases or, or widely used in legislation. And I can understand why some elements of that may appear, but I applaud your sentiment in general terms. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Paul's wrong, so I'm there on the 
educational aspect there. So clearly, as I said, as a teacher and a few feedback and, and all what we call command work is, is a big element of it. Um, and that's certainly something that I, I, I would understand to be, to be brought with it. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's an aspect of education, which is education as a whole. I think there's kind of lots of things which, which occur in government, um, which almost appears as kind of cloak and daggers, and I think there needs to be a little bit more openness in terms of that. So I'd certainly be in favour of, of promoting uh, kind of more everyday language. I think the clearer, the more concise that can be, the, the, the brevity of it, just to avoid any confusion for anybody. Um, as Paul said, the, the, there is a legal stance, and I'm sure that the, the legal people need to, to be backed up by that. But within that, I'm sure we could put together some sort of statement or more user-friendly language that would, that would display it, the, the particular piece of legislation um, in a little bit more of a concise way for, for everyday uh, use. So I certainly would be in favour of that, yes. Thank you. And I think that's understandable. And understandable by you, by me, by everybody. And it's not understandable how can we follow the law. So I, plain English would be good. But as long as it's then still legal, in the sense that if somebody did do something either wrong or right, then know they're following the right instructions. So understandable is how I would put it. If that's plain English, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, anything that helps people understand and engage with our parliament, I think it's helpful. So yes, I support that. I'm not sure how much they'll achieve in 15 months. Uh, and I think it's not just the actual wording on the bills, it's the language that's used in the debating chambers. All of this, I beg to move, and my honourable member, and all oh, so I think that, to be honest, I think that's one of the reasons why people sometimes struggle to engage with the mult and, and both the branches. So anything we can do to, to, to bring it more accessible to the people who we represent, I think would be commendable. Absolutely right, but there is a danger by Englishifying or simplifying it that, that there would be ways around things. I think that's that's, that's why law is developed. Um, but I, I mean, I've been sitting reading legislation, trying to swat up and reading Hansard of the MLC meetings, and they call it the other place. And it, it's really bizarre to actually sit and read it. It is tough. You're right, but they do issue summaries of legislation and. Um, sort of background reading, so that is there if you dig around and look for it. So, in one sense, I completely agree. However, I think we've got to just be careful to not English apply it too much. I think that we could be in danger of opening ourselves. No, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Great. I feel you're Andrew. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, previously I was a chartered tax advisor in the UK. I spent many years trying to uh, interpret and understand HMRC legislation. Uh, during that time, wrote a number of articles trying to encourage greater simplification uh, of, of that legislation. Uh, I'll leave you to be the judge of the success or otherwise of that, given the, the, the current raft of, of tax legislation in the UK. Um, legislation has to be clear, it has to be understandable, it has to be accessible. In an ideal world, that should be plain English, but as Corelli says, that's not always the case because sometimes there's a danger to, towards oversimplification. But certainly, I see a key role of uh, LegCo of uh, making sure that the legislation is as brief as it can be, says what was intended by the keys when it was introduced, and that if there is a better way of saying it, then maybe putting that forward. But ultimately, certainty, clarity, and accessibility. As you know, when it comes to law, words matter. And it's really important that we are able to convey the words in a very concise and clear format. Believe it or not, you're taught in law school to use plain English. And I think what happens is the younger generation comes out of schools and they're competing with an older mindset who's used to using the aforesaid language. So I think what we need to do is encourage, like you said, people to understand that the end users of these laws need to be able to understand them and be able to abide by them. And by using language that's clear, concise, and on point with the intention, we're going to get closer to everybody being able to understand and be able to participate in our laws. Thank you, Mr. Right. Right. That's good.